To start today's talk, um, James said to me that I'll be talking about charging, how to charge what you're worth. And at face value, you think, yeah, you know, I, I do deserve to charge what I'm worth, right? Am I wrong? No? And then you think, hang on, I'm, you know, I'm quite priceless. If I were to die today, and I did research it, and my body parts get sold off, I'm actually a millionaire when I'm dead. <laughs> but on the other hand, my skill, what I do, I make cakes. My skill, not so much, because there are other people that can make the same things that I do, some better, some worse, and we all know that. So how do we then charge what we're worth? Should the question be how to get my current clients to pay me more? Wouldn't we like that? Or should the question be, how do I find clients to pay me more, right? So, and that's a topic that we all struggle with and we all want to know about. So I then did a bit of digging and then I realized one thing, I'm a very simple person, straight to the point. There are three people in this relationship with clients. There's us, there's the environment in which we operate, and then there's a client. Would you agree? Okay, so I'm gonna start by asking Andrew. I'm gonna pick on Andrew. Um, that's Andrew Cousins, amazing videographer. So I'm gonna ask you, Andrew, what do you do? I'm a filmmaker. You're a filmmaker. What do you sell? Films. What do people buy from you? They're obviously buying my ability or my team's ability to tell a story or present something okay. or to market something. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Yeah. James, you're on the hot spot. What do you do? I find business for our clients. You find? Business for our clients. Okay. Indirectly. Okay. What do you sell? Physical space and shows and two and a half days in a conference. And what do people buy from you? The opportunity of getting more business by attending something. Okay, so those are all great questions, but do you see how those questions begin a different thought process when it comes to charging? So we know what we all do, and we tell our clients what we do, but what they're buying from us is completely different to what we do. And this was a lesson that I learned over the years. And then I had to put myself in their position and think, so I will now answer the question. So what do I do? I make cakes. What do I sell? I sell the halo effect. And the halo effect is your brand. And that's positive. In my previous life, I was a headhunter and some candidates came with a halo. They walked on water, we'd heard amazing things about what they did, till they sat in front of me and I had to interview them. And then the halo, not so shiny in some cases, some cases iridescent, you know, shined brighter. And then some candidates will come with a horn effect. Everyone has painted them as the devil. They're no good, da, 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 but they sit in front of you and they, you know, your mind is changed. And we sometimes in our businesses, we experience that. I've had consultations that have gone fantastically and some not so much. So we sell the halo effect, we sell the horn effect. Another thing we sell is also us. We are you know, I see people say, I'm the CEO of X, I'm the director of Y, I'm the blah, 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 blah. No, you're not. You're the chief client officer of your company. Every person in your company is the chief client officer. I was speaking with Daniela. Where's Daniela? Daniela works for Andrew. And I'd noticed her. She was everywhere. She was taking photos, Instagramming, etc., etc. So we had a bit of a chat. And she spoke about, you know, she was here in the morning, she's going to be here tomorrow, yet, you know, I saw the commitment, I saw the passion. If I was a client doing mystery shopping, 
I've already bought into Andrew because his team are hardworking, they like him. So that's another thing we sell. Every one of us, we are our own chief client officer. We also sell our emotional intelligence. Half the time, when a client sits in front of me, they already have made up their mind as to whether they're going to get the cake from me or not. They're just looking for extra confirmation. Do we vibe? Do we gel? Is there chemistry? All that takes emotional intelligence in reading the client in front of you. And we're going to get to that in a moment because what I've done is I've categorized my clients into five distinct types. And this is the luxury um, type of client. And it's useful for you to know that luxury clients are not a mono. Just because they have money doesn't mean they act the same, they think the same. There are different, they got their money in different ways. Some inherited, some made it, some stole it, whatever. I don't care. They're my client, they're sitting in front of me. I afford them that respect. So moving on, the other things that we sell. We also sell unconsciously or consciously, we sell other people, other people that are affiliated with us. So you're here today at Bride Lux. Your clients are thinking, oh, that looks fancy, that looks nice. We're also, by being here, we are selling the Langham Hotel. Now, the Langham Hotel was actually the first modern hotel in the whole of Europe. It was the first hotel to have water closets and all the fancy things we take for granted nowadays. And then they ran into bad times, like all businesses, then they tried to resell to the BBC, there was a bit of a hoo-ha, yada, 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 and here we are today, 2019. And the latest thing they're doing is a school, a cookery school called Sauce, I think. Now, that's of interest to me because obviously I bake cakes and I'm half in love with Michelle Rue. It was a shame I didn't meet him today. I would have fangled him to death. But what I'm trying to say is, being here today, we are also selling the Langham Hotel. And the Langham, they have sold themselves to us today. The food was superb, the hospitality amazing. So that is another thing that you sell. I can go on and on and on because I have a list about, you know, 25 mile long. But, you know, if you want to have a longer list, come see me later because I need to move on. So let's now look at us as a business. As a business, there are five types of luxury businesses. We've got pure luxury business. So what do I mean by pure luxury? A pure luxury business can sell, I don't know, pebbles. Say Chanel started selling pebbles. I'd expect um, the pebbles to be black and white, adorned with pearls, in a nifty little bag, tied with a bow, yada, 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 the works. Are the pebbles of any use? No. But do I want one? Yes. Do I need one? No. Then the next category is the prestige business. So prestige means you're selling something of value, of, um, of use, features, service, product, the whole nine yards. So that would be something like, I don't know, maybe Aston Martin. It, you know, that's a prestige business. Then you move on to your premium business. Premium takes the best of the features of your prestige and mashes them together and you get a premium business. Then you go down to a mastige. So mastige would be something like Apple. So iPhone, etc., etc. And they created a cult and a tribe around that. And then the last one might be something like a boutique business. So I would say quite a lot of us in this room are boutique businesses. And the good thing about being a boutique business is that you can hide behind that. Because when you say you're boutique, no one really questions it, really, do they? You know, I'm boutique, I have a studio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the good thing about that is that in, in terms of selling and charging, calling yourself a boutique has some prestige behind it, so you can use that. And I'm talking here as someone who started from scratch, no money, no connections, no friend, no job, just started from scratch and somehow found herself building a brand. So there's that aspect. So that's us as a business. Now, I'm now going to delve, and I think this is where 
the bulk of my talk is going to be, I'll delve into the client side. So that's the third bit. Now, the client has to be center of everything we do. If the client is not center, forget about it. You don't really have a business, you have a hobby. The client has to be center, you have to know the kind of client you want to attract, and then go out and attract them. That is what the books say. But you're saying, yes, but how? And where do I find them? And everyone has suggestions and ideas. Oh, just say this words and do that and do that. But I want to delve a bit more into the psychology. So every category that I discuss, I'll talk about the psychology as well. Now, I'm going to mention the five types of clients, just in case I run out of time in the end. So at least you've got the five different types in the luxury business. So the first type would be the aspiring. I call them the, the aspiring or the aspirants or the strivers. So that, you know, they're striving, you know, they're on the ladder. Um, they view luxury as the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate goal, you know, in terms of, okay, I may not be born into luxury. I may not have a lot of money, but if I save up enough and I have a decent enough budget, I might be able to do a wedding that is luxury. So aspirationals, I call them. They tend to be younger. That is where you're going to get the most diversity. So you need, really, really need to pay attention to that. This is where you can find people from different cultures, um, different, you know, as Jove um, said earlier, you know, different, you know, as aspirations, different values, etc., etc. So you need to tune in, uh, key into that. So the second set of um, clients that you might come across would be what I call the innovators. So some people call them the drivers. So they don't, they, they, they probably might not use Pinterest so much because they don't want to copy everything, but they have very different ideas and very firm ideas. How many times have I heard wedding planners say, I wish I could have a client that would use color. I want a client that would do this. I want a client that would do that. The innovators, that is where you would find such clients. The only problem with innovators is that sometimes they don't know how much things cost. They have these crazy ideas, absolutely wild, but they haven't got the budget to back it. So that, but that is where you will get, in terms of doing something creative and something new, that would be that category. The third category of client, luxury client, um, that I've often come across, they're my favorite. Um, I call them the comfort first. So it's all about comfort. They tend to be really, really wealthy, seriously wealthy. So it's not about the money to them. And I tend to watch out for certain words with them. It's not so much about them. It's all about how people would feel. I want my guests to taste what I'm tasting. I want my guests to see that sunrise. I want my guests to do this, to do that, to do the other. That is how you can identify and say, okay, they're all about comfort. And then another thing I, no I notice about them is that they tend to be older and they might accompany a very young bride and groom. And I had one fairly recently, they did Everything I expected that they would do, booked a wedding at Blenheim Palace, and it wasn't the orangery, it wasn't the Great Hall, it was actually the library. Um, they even talked about having this massive, massive marquee, and they were driving the conversation, the parents were. But I noticed that the bride was rather quiet. And, you know, obviously they booked me, everything was fine, and then I got home, but I had this sense of unease. And then I called the planner and I said, Thank you, appreciate you, you know, bringing me along, recommending me, but I didn't hear from the bride. I want to know what she thinks. And I want to give her free reign, tell me what she thinks, and I'll square it with the parents. Let me be the bad guy. So that's the only thing with the comfort first. Then the next um, category of um, client, only the best. I call them only the best. So to them, it's about the labels. Now, the thing about this category of client is that they will research the hell out of you. They will go online, they will read all your reviews, 
they're very, very impressed with any review that you get from a big brand. Um, the fact that maybe you've worked with a certain fashion label, the fact that, you know, in your Instagram post, you, you were in some amazing location or another, they're impressed with that. And you'll often find an indication of that from the very first email they send you because they want to boast about how amazing their wedding is going to be and how privileged you are to be part of their wedding. So from the very first email, they'll lead with the name, we are getting married in this hotel and this person is, is involved and that person's involved. Then you know, aha, they are likely to be what I call only the best. So let's recap. How many people have I mentioned? How many categories so far? Four. Four. So what are they? Aspiring. Sorry, aspi aspiring. Innovating. Innovating. Comfort first. Only the best. Okay. So number five. Now what's my number five? Number five, <laughs> number five um, tend to be, have I talked about innovators? Okay, so number five, they tend to be all about bringing people together. So for them, it's all about sharing and caring. And they're very, very particular about that. Even the, the language they use. So they, you know, so they might email and say, um, we would like to share our day with our friends. We would like to have people experience what we are experiencing. So those are the buzzwords. Those are the keywords to look for with the sharing and caring. Also, they will talk about sustainability because that's becoming very, very important to some people. So they might want to know the footprint of, um, I don't know, the vegetables that are being, you know, served. They want to know um, the, the produce. They want to know about, you know, I don't know, even things like, I mean, I had a bride and she was asking about the dye that was used to dye the napkins because she wanted them a certain shade, antique shade. And then she was told it was going to be made from tea. And she said, oh, but can you use um, um, old tea bags? And I'm thinking, who thinks of that level of detail? But that's what she wanted. So again, those are things that people care about and that people, you know, want us as their suppliers or vendors to care about. So when it comes to charging for the different categories, how do you go about having that conversation? So for the innovator, for example, I find, and this is from experience, I have not tested this hypothesis or anything like that. From experience, and again, just to emphasize, not putting anybody in a box, these are just ways in which I make sense of my world, of the world of luxury. So the innovators, for example, to have that conversation, you have to keep bringing them back to the fact that your ideas, they're fantastic, they're amazing. You replay the words, what, you know, they have their buzzwords, what they want to do. We want to be different, you know. We want to do this and we want to do that. And straight away, you need to be very, very clear about the budget. Also, they tend to be detail-oriented. So they want to know, how, if I want that, how is that going to be achieved? So a good example would be something like, if you're a planner, and I don't know, maybe they want a hot air balloon to land the bride because it's happened. I've seen it on, on Instagram before where a bride had this hot hair balloon thing. And you just say to them, get a video of the behind the scenes of 100 people working on the hot air balloon and say, this is where your money is going to go. So the £100,000 that I, I wanted to charge for having this experience will take 1,000 people working on you having this experience. So you need to be very, very upfront about money. They might say to you, oh, well, I didn't really think it was that expensive, yada, yada, yada. This is where you can say to them, well, it's innovative, it's risky, and we need to mitigate that risk. 
because innovators sometimes they don't understand risk so you need to let them know yes you've got these cool ideas you might want pyrotechnics everywhere but this is where you need to come in with the laws with the rules etc etc there was a bride um, she wanted and this is a true story she wanted a dancing bear she actually wanted a real-life bear at her wedding and she was ready to throw millions at it and we had to let her know now the thing is because I'm a cake maker I'm considered to be neutral in all this so the wedding planner was like are you kidding me the the, the, the animal cruelty laws alone make this absolutely uh, it's just unthinkable so it had to be broken down and I said look I'm just a cake maker here however I think you should listen to your planner because you don't want to get put in jail I was very blunt with her and you know because well that's me I said you I said you will go to jail number one and number two it's impossible in this country it's simply not done and this is where if she the wedding planner that she was buying I then realized the reason she chose that wedding planner is because the wedding planner had very very good taste and I said to her if your wedding you're, you've chosen this wedding planner because they dictate taste you know they you know they they they're classy etc etc and you wanted and it was her dream to have an English wedding and this was where I said if you get Debrett's there is nothing in Debrett's about animals at weddings so for a classic English wedding I suggest that you listen to your planner and thankfully she did because she was a kind of bride her father would have given her anything and that is also a bad thing so for the second set we talked about um, only the best will do now the danger with only the best is that they research everything down to the last penny so they might say to you but why are you charging XYZ when this person is charging XYZ now you'd I try not to get into I'm charging X because of this or I'm charging X because of Y and I don't give breakdowns or anything like that I will simply reiterate the value that I bring to the table with me you don't have to worry about this you don't have to worry about that you don't have to worry about that if anything happens if anything goes wrong this is where I step in and from the conversation we have I will say what are you doing about this what are you doing about that what are you doing about that so they know I'm thinking wide and not just about my part of the wedding and at the same time I'm using my other colleagues and suppliers as allies because sometimes that's something we don't do enough of because we're our own you know I'm cake you know I might talk to the florist but that's about it but from the production company the venue etc etc we need to use allies and back each other up and respond and say that is the market rate that is what we charge that is how we do it because only the best people they're all about the labels and then I sometimes wonder where does that come from it comes from wanting to show people that they are given the best experience that they know how to give nothing more than that I think they want to show people and some, for some cultures is a matter of face as well because la certain labels are universally recognized no matter what culture you're from so some weddings would literally have a cart or a stall from a very well-known um, I call it it's a supermarket anyway from, from a very known supermarket in Knightsbridge they would ha literally have plenty of those stalls at the weddings just to show that we know about the best of the best so for, for that when you charge you charge a premium because if you're going to be seen in the company of the best of the best that is what you have to do in my view so then moving on to people who are comfort first now all, um, all about comfort you know all about it needs to be feel comfortable now these are the super super wealthy they're used to wealth I mean used to it stupendous wealth 
to the point where they don't even see it anymore. And they'll only go with, you know, they only would shop and live within a certain postcode, especially in London, as it because again, I'm talking from my experience as it applies to London. They only live within a certain postcode, within a certain street. And the reason I know this is because at one point, I was supposed to do business with a couple of them. And they said, between Harvey Nicks and Harrods, that is where we need to locate this business. Anywhere else, the people we'll know will not, we know will not go there. Now, the thing about the super wealthy is that they will argue with you over 50 pounds as much as a million. Because it's not about the money, it's about the principle. And it's about trust. And it's about being in that inner circle. And it's about if they WhatsApp you, so a lot of them, funnily enough, they WhatsApp. They don't do emails, they don't do whatever. Or you might get a call from a business manager. So you need to establish who the person you're talking to is. You need to find out if they're the ones who are actually going to pay the money. Because some business managers are pretty powerful. They control the expenses. So you need to find out, are you going to be responsible for billing? And the way I normally ask, I would just say something like, um, who do I need to send the invoice to? And how do you want the invoice sent? Do you want it by hand on paper or do you want it by email? Because some of them do not want an email trail, not because they're trying doing anything dodgy or they're hiding, but because of security reasons. So if you get that phone call, somebody who knows someone has probably recommended you and, you, and then when you go and have a meeting, you need to act unfazed. You need, and there are certain things you might see, you need to act like you don't see it. Seriously. There, I mean, I've been in a situation where I walked in and the couple were at it, calling each other all sorts of names. So I had to respectfully back away and then I respectfully waited and somebody said something like, oh, Elizabeth, you didn't see that, did you? And I'm like, see what? It's none of my business at the end of the day. Um, yes, thankfully, they got married. I was able to make the cake, but that's not why I'm happy. <laughs> but that's not why I'm happy. But there are certain things you would see with the super wealthy because they don't. And the mentality, and to, and to try and explain what I'm trying to say, I had a client, she forgot her favorite pair of jeans in a hotel halfway around the world. And she paid thousands to have it couriered over rather than just go out and buy another pair of jeans, exact brand, exact make, for, the, you know, for cheaper. So that is the mentality. So they will spend money on, if they think what you're doing is worth it. So that is why I always ask this question. And it's a very blunt question. Is my cake in the top five of your priorities for this wedding? If it's top 20, see you later, because I know they will not pay. Even if I give it to them, they won't, they won't take it. Because some clients are like that, they're super wealthy. But if it's within the top three or the top five, or if they say to me, we're gonna have a ceremony, because some of the cuttings, cake cutting ceremonies actually last for an hour. You know, there's the entrance, then there's the music, then there's a the dancing around the cake. Their cake is made a fuss of. My cakes get such amazing attention. I get nothing, seriously. I absolutely get nothing. Because unfortunately, I do not look like my cakes. People see the cake and go, oh my God, amazing. You mean you made it? That's what they say to me. I'm like, hello. But seriously though, if the cake is in the top five or top three, then you can charge a premium. But if the cake or anything you do is, if you're a wedding planner, You'll be shocked if you, you need to ask that question. Is wedding, is, you know, is wedding planning one of the top priorities for this wedding? Now, at that point, don't sell. Don't sell. Because if it's priority, great. If it's not priority, just say to them, well, I know someone who might be able to help you. 
and then walk away because you will not get what you deserve to charge. So moving on, so we've spoken about the aspiring, we've spoken about the super wealthy. There is something as being too available. You respond immediately. You know, you, you should always respond immediately. You know, they call, you respond. But they need to know you run a business. If they created the business for me, that's great. I'm at their beck and call 24-7. I don't mind. It's their business, and I'm, the ma I'm just, you know, a manager. Um, you also need to control your branding. You need to get, I mean, even today, um, I was saying something about my, I know my website needs updating. As soon as Alan spoke, where's Alan? Thank you, Alan. As soon as he spoke, I knew he was talking to me. My website needs updating. My uh, testimonial needs updating. I haven't done the bumps. There's a lot I know needs to improve on my website. And then the person um, I was saying it to said, oh my God, but your website is so lovely. But that's not the point. It's not about a pretty website anymore. It's about an effective and working website. The thing is, if you aspire to be a certain brand, okay, say for example, you, need to, you want to be a Chanel. Chanel is my favorite, my muse, you know, I want to be a Chanel. If I want to be a Chanel, I need to think and act like a Chanel. I need to present like a Chanel. So I'm thinking, okay, what would Coco Chanel do? She would update. You know, she would stand her ground on certain things, but she didn't just make dresses for just anybody. And in fact, she went against the grain because her dresses were rather plain. And it was the fabric that she used to differentiate herself. And she used black and white. In those days, everything else was frou-frou and pink and whatever. Remember, I'm not being horrible, but your competitors or your um, colleagues in the wedding industry, they're not your clients. They can recommend you, but they're not your end user. They're not your client. So everything you, you do needs to go towards your client. So if you want a client of a certain type, so what I also do as well, I have the picture of my ideal client. I know exactly what they're going to wear. I know what the, the kind of suit they wear. I know the kind of dress they wear. I know where they shop, where they eat. I know everything about them. So whatever I do is geared towards that. And another thing you can do is set yourself up as an expert. So if you've not been blogging, you need to blog. There was some, I was speaking to Amy earlier today, and we were talking about the power of blogging. When you blog, you blog from a position of authority and respect. You need that as well. So you need the visuals, which we all rush to do, but you also need the words as well to elevate your brand. Elizabeth, that was very impressive. Thank, Thank you. you.